All right. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, and welcome to the Summer of Protocols 2024 Town Hall. Um, it's going to be a little uh, session here for us to give some explanation around what 2024 Summer of Protocols is going to look like and an opportunity for you all to ask some questions uh, and comments on the program. So without further ado, I will pass it to Venkat to go ahead and uh, start us over here. All right. Uh, I've shared my screen. Um, can you put that on? Oh, there we go. All right. Welcome, everybody. And really pleased to be doing this uh, once again. We had a lot of fun doing this um, last year. And we're really pleased to be doing it again this year, the Summer of Protocols. So uh, for those of you who just kind of randomly wandered in because you saw the link on the socials or something, quick orientation note about what exactly this is. This is a summer program, but with um, off-season activity like talks as well. Uh, and we started it last year, ran the first instance. This is the second instance. It's primarily funded by the Ethereum Foundation, though we in this year we'll have some partners as well. And uh, the goal is to foster research on protocols in the broadest sense. Um, and beyond that, um, do what we call promoting protocol literacy, like prepare the world for living in a more protocolized state. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. And also kind of build deeper reserves of like capabilities and knowledge around protocols um, in you know traditional organizations and around the world. So that Venn diagram is a um, good sort of like first way to get oriented, which is protocols is this huge space of like techno social things. Within that, of course, there are lots of familiar tech protocols like you know uh, TCP, IP, and others you might be familiar with, but also social protocols like you know diplomacy, foreign policy, protocol in courtrooms, things like that. And there's also, of course, since um, this is funded by the Ethereum Foundations, blockchains are a piece of it. So we think of that as a subset of all protocols and then Ethereum within that. But the focus of this program is on the large circle. It's on protocols in the broadest sense. So keep that in mind. We are interested in blockchains and Ethereum, of course, and other tech protocols, but our focus overall is on the broadest sense because that's a kind of a scope that's missing in a lot of more narrow programs, which is what we're trying to address here. Um, oh, I'm in the wrong. <laughs> Okay, uh, so quick outline of uh, this session. First, Tim will give you a little download on why the EF is doing this at all. Then I'll walk through uh, sort of the outline of the program, what we hope to achieve, what we are looking for in applications. Um, then Tim will have a little bit more to say on um, uh, what we might be looking for in specifically blockchain themed applications for those of you who are doing that. Of course, the program is open to any sort of uh, protocol research. Uh, and then we'll have um, one of the uh, alumni of last year's program, Timber, give you a little sense of what it was like to participate in the program last year. And then we'll have Q&A. All right. Uh, so with that, um, uh, a quick um, sort of like 411, or sorry for the American metaphor there, but yeah, just basics you need to keep in mind who we all are. I'm the program director, so all research-related questions, uh, direct them at me. Tim is the executive sponsor from the Ethereum Foundation and also our sort of like uh, team expert on like blockchain-y things. So direct those questions to him. Josh Davis, who you just heard is the program coordinator, uh, taking care of logistics and ops. So you'll be interacting with him in the application process. Uh, Jenna is the editor in chief, um, responsible for driving a lot of our existing research that has come online. And Timber Shroff is uh, helping us off. Uh, like I said, he's an alumnus and he's also the evangelist for SOP too. So you'll see him around the forum and so forth. So you can contact any of us by posting on the forum and tagging us. So some links to keep in mind. There's of course the call for applications link. The forum is going to be very important. That's where we are um, having you all post your RFCs. Uh, you can of course look at all the research we are publishing. That's at summerprotocols.com slash research. And there's a whole bunch of 
talks recorded from last year's both guest and researcher talks. And there's actually one coming up right after this information session um, on planetary scale protocols by um, some people from the Berggruen Institute. So stick around for that if you want like a taste of the program. Um, and two key dates to keep in mind, April 12th, all applications are due, uh, but I suggest posting your RFCs as early as possible, hopefully by March 31st, because you want to give people a chance to like react and give you useful suggestions. So with that, I'll pass it on to Tim to say a little bit about uh, why the Ethereum Foundation is funding this. Yeah, uh, thanks, Nick, for uh, kicking this off. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Tim Bako. I work at the EF. And the sort of genesis for Summer of Protocols uh, came out of me reaching out to Vancap because of my work on Ethereum. Um, I help coordinate different protocol upgrades to Ethereum. And I had all these questions around, like, how should we think about stewarding this protocol? How is like working on a protocol different than say working on a company or working on uh, an other type of open source tech tech project? And for something like Ethereum specifically, which has like a, a the idea of like a, a persistence across time, like how should that shape our thinking? And I was I was quite dissatisfied with just the quality of mental models and frameworks that we had to think about Ethereum and protocols. It felt like for Ethereum specifically, we'd always reason by analogy where we're saying like Ethereum's just like a country or it's just like a tech platform or Ethereum's like a, a currency. And those things never kind of get at the nature of like what we're dealing with here. So we had this idea of studying protocols across a whole bunch of domains and trying to see whether we could extract some commonalities or some like uh, insights that apply to not just Ethereum, but to things in architecture, things in workplace safety, things in a bunch of different domains um, and, and help us better understand protocols as a whole. So this is what we did last summer. Uh, we funded a first batch of, batch of researchers, about 30 of them, to research protocols across a whole bunch of industries, across a whole bunch of themes. Um, we covered things like memory, like, uh, again, workplace safety, like the built environment, and got like a lot of really interesting, differing perspectives around protocols. Not enough to like come up with a grand unified theory of protocols yet, but at least a hint at like, what are some interesting rabbit holes that we can go and expand and, and, and dig into further? And that's roughly kind of the framing around why we want to keep doing this and, and, and how we want to approach it this summer. And where having a, having gone from like no sort of research or, or field study of protocols to this like broad overview of the space, um, our idea now is can we find a few select areas where it's worth going deep and trying to actually run experiments, gather some data around protocols um, so that we can we can kind of complement the, the breadth of insights that we got out of last summer um, with some applied research. Um, so that's a high level, sort of the motivation behind this, what we're looking to get out of this. Um, again, I'll reemphasize, you know, like my sort of intellectual curiosity in this started from Ethereum, um, but this is not like the main thing we're after. We're not looking to just find Ethereum stuff or to like have people focus on blockchain. We want people to think about protocols as a first class topic and and study that. Um, yeah, back to you, Venkat. And back to the slides. Oh, are the slides visible? I'm not seeing them on my screen. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. Okay, so I, I want to say a little bit about program philosophy before diving in um, to the details of the application process, uh, because um, I find that whenever people get into this topic, it's it's kind of a natural instinct to like uh, sort of like stick with what you're already familiar with, things like, you know, startups or product innovation, or if you're in a nonprofit sector, so nonprofit grant applications, it's familiar and reassuring to stick with that, but we want to uh, like encourage you to like shift those mental models a little bit. So I'll explain a little bit of our philosophy here and then get into the details. All right, so uh, program philosophy. So first, don't worry too much about what protocols are. So last pro year, we did spend a lot of time thinking about it, arguing about definitions and things like that. And it was useful. It was useful to do that for the first year. And what we realized that was just about everything is a protocol if you look at it in the right way. So you do have to think about it a little bit. It's a very different perspective on things you see around you in the world. But think of 
uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, if you'll excuse my analogy, it's a little bit like uh, pornography. It's like, you know it when you see it. So everything from hand washing to the procedures for launching nuclear missiles is a protocol and everything in between, including, like I said, you know, courtrooms and things like that. So if it looks like a protocol or from a particular perspective, it has a very protocolized look, you can sort of start thinking about that as a suitable topic for uh, research in protocol uh, ways. And uh, uh, you can like, you know, think about how protocolized is it? When did it get protocolized? Should it be more or less protocolized than it already is? So it's a very useful overall frame for asking very basic first principles questions about everything from hand washing to nuclear uh, launches, right? So don't think too much about it, but also don't think too little about it either. Don't like randomly say, hey, I'm eating ice cream. That's a protocol and therefore I'll research it. Like, you know, no, don't be flippant about it. I mean, we've spent a year thinking about this, so we kind of have some depth of taste here, so we will know <laughs> what you're talking about. Uh, all right. So why protocols? Why not think about big problems in the world through more conventional frames? Like, you know, what should governments and states do? What should the UN do to combat climate change? What should big companies do to like, you know, uh, make AI safe? So those are like very familiar frames for thinking about big, big issues in our world, right? So and I think of them as the tip of an iceberg, right? So everything you see dominating the news uh, today, all the like crazy AI, climate, culture war stuff, meaning crisis, the two big wars going on, the sort of like hot foreground way of thinking about them is kind of the familiar way. And those are the categories we normally use. But protocols is kind of the iceberg, 90% of the iceberg below of all these sort of like unconscious background stuff that keeps the world running and actually shapes how these sort of big foreground things evolve, right? So one quote that was really influential throughout last year as sort of a lighthouse idea is this quote from A.N. Whitehead, the philosopher. So civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. So that bold part is the key part. Protocols kind of fade into the background and you take them for granted. And unless you develop a particular kind of like, you know, way of looking at the world, you won't even see them, which is why they're like both so powerful and so hard to think about. Like, you know, it's easy to go on chat GPT and think about AI purely in the context of your interaction with the uh, AI product you're using. It's much harder to think about the background invisible protocols of like, how is training actually managed? How should the relationships of one AI to the other be managed? All these things tend to fade into the background. And another uh, lens I want to offer you is this quote by Andy Grove, the um, legendary founder of Intel, which is, uh, first let or see your other uh, first let chaos reign, then reign in the chaos. Uh, so he meant this at the level of like startups and companies. You know, at a early startup phase, it's like very chaotic, um, and the entire blockchain sector is like this, for example, right now. But then you reign in the chaos, and protocols. That's when they kick in. When the chaos has gotten to a certain point of like generative potential, but if it overheats, it's going to like blow up. That's when you start putting structures in place, and that's protocols. But we want you to think about this beyond like, you know, conventional contexts like organizations or uh, corporations. You want to think about this reigning in the chaos at the level of the planet. And by the way, today's um, talk right after the session will be a very useful um, sort of like immersion and thinking about reigning in the chaos at almost a planetary scale. So nine tenths of the iceberg, keep that mental model in mind. The second mental model I want to offer you is you guys, if you're thinking of applying to this program, you obviously are super creative people, lots of ideas, lots of energy to do interesting things in lots of different ways. And there's a lot of places you could go. Like the world is desperate for like good imaginative energy, right? And I've tried to plot these all on the diagram, right? You've got Silicon Valley style entrepreneurship. You've got people building B Corps, trying to do social good as well as like uh, make a profit at the same time. You've got like, you know, on the other side, you've you know, people working on nonprofits. Uh, you've got people in like tough places like Haiti, like taking revolutionary approaches to doing, um, you know, bringing about change. And then you've got like, you know, government and government programs. All these things I think are, almost like little circles around the big mass core of stuff that can deal with and uh, sort of like benefit a lot from like creative imaginative attention, but never gets it because it never appears in the frame of any of these conventional models, right? Like if you had an idea for improving how people wash their hands, where would you go? 
that's not a pitch you can take to Silicon Valley, right? That's not even a pitch you can take to the WHO. You kind of have to find a weird way to do it, right? And I think of like 90% of the ways you can improve the world from all levels, from like, you know, very small, like how to wash your hands better to very huge, like, you know, how to affect climate change. These are all protocol opportunities, protocol entrepreneurship opportunities that are kind of illegible. They don't become visible in the regular frames. And part of the reason this program exists is to kind of like go after this huge opportunity. And the, of course, this is like the way I've drawn it. This is like 10 times the size of any other like more structured opportunity. But of course, this is a tiny little program, a drop, a drop in the bucket, um, which is like, you know, we always feel like we are uh, David versus Goliath kind of like program, but it's a start. Can we actually go after all these broad opportunities that may not be visible otherwise? So keep this in mind. I also want you to think about what exactly protocol entrepreneurship looks like and how it's different from things like being a startup entrepreneur or you know a um, nonprofit person. So I made up this Venn diagram of there's these three circles of like people with a lot of reformist fervor. You're holy warrior. You see something wrong and you want to change it. So I call that reformist fervor. Then there's what I call the insider expertise uh, circle, which is, you know, you worked in a sector or domain for like 10, 15 years, and you know a lot about it. Like, you know, things that outsiders wouldn't know. So you see things outsiders wouldn't see. Right. And then, of course, you've got the third circle, which is, you know, just the character of entrepreneurial imagination and hustle. And if you intersect these three, you get like various regions. You're all familiar with um, Venn diagrams. But we want you at the very center of this. And you can see kind of the regions around it. If you just have reformist fervor and insider expertise and no imagination or no entrepreneurial hustle, chances are you're going to be limited to whistleblowing. You like point out a bad situation and call for reform, which is good, but it's often not enough. Same thing with like, you know, you don't have insider knowledge, but you have reformist holy warrior fervor and you have imagination. You might end up being what the critics tend to call naive solutionists. Um, so a lot of Silicon Valley type people who go after big opportunities often get criticized for this, that they don't actually know anything about the deep insights of a domain and are coming up with like, you know, very childish solutions. So aim for the intersection of these three circles, which is protocol entrepreneur. And I want to give you a list of names. You can Google the ones that are not familiar, but I'll call out a few of them to give you a different set of mental models and role models to think about as you approach this application and you know just your overall career in protocols. So if you're in Silicon Valley, you have your role models like you know Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, others. You should be looking to a different kind of person when you think of protocol entrepreneurship. So I'll call out a few. John Boyd, many of you may have heard of him. He came up with this idea called the OODA loop. And he had a whole history in the military of reforming various protocols, starting with he rewrote the fighter tactics manual at Nellis Air Force Base, which is not something you would do in a startup or as a product, like literally going and reforming how fighter uh, pilots learned their skills, right? Rosa Parks, it's a very small thing she did, which is like, you know, challenge a segregated seating arrangement in public transportation with a very small act of defiance and that sparked a revolution. I would call that protocol entrepreneurship, right? She didn't give a speech or sermon. Other people did that. That's also a useful thing to do. She just sat in a different place on the uh, bus. Here's an unfamiliar name, William Sims. So about uh, a century ago, William Sims was a naval officer who went on exercises with the British. So he was a US Navy officer. He went on exercises with the British Navy and noticed that the British Navy had much better procedures for firing artillery, which ended up with much higher accuracy in uh, wartime. And he went back to the US Navy and said, we should adopt these procedures and policies for firing uh, uh, naval artillery because they're much more accurate. And he was laughed out. He was resisted. And ultimately what he did was he took his case to uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who basically supported him and told the Navy to do what he said. And that really leveled up um, the Navy's protocols for artillery. And some of these other names um, uh, you should uh, recognize. Florence Nightingale, literally turning hand-washing into life-saving in the middle of the Crimean War. 
taking the theories of Joseph Lister and putting them into practice as a protocol. Mohamed Yunus, a banker who took a small idea of like how to do microcredit financing, especially for groups of women, and revolutionized a whole bunch of like um, um, very poor segments of society and unleashed entrepreneurial energy. Uh, Rachel Carson led a campaign to ban DDT, completely reformed agricultural uh, sort of like, uh, pesticide control protocols, and kind of saved the world, the environment, right? Uh, one that's a particular favorite of mine, Bindeshwar Pathak, he was a social entrepreneur who started this foundation called uh, the Sulab Foundation in India. And this was basically to construct public toilets all over India, which is kind of like a, something India needs really badly. And um, including like innovating like particular low cost toilets that could be easily in, uh, installed. Uh, Billy Bean, the movie Moneyball was made about him. Simply changing the protocols for selecting baseball playing talent allowed him to kind of revolutionize the game of baseball. Of course, other bigger teams caught up and copied him, but point was he was a protocol entrepreneur. So I encourage you to go Google all these names and sort of like get a sense of who are the role, model, uh, role models, who are the uh, heroes and heroines of the stories that you should be drawing inspiration from, and what did they do differently from Steve Jobs and others who you might be more familiar with. Again, it's not like one is better than the other. It's simply a different model and mindset. So think hard about like uh, how you're thinking about your problem. All right, let's uh, switch gears and uh, get more tactical about the program. So two big URLs to keep in mind, the CFA link on the Summer Protocol site and then the forum. So let's look at each. Let me make sure I can share this, share this tab instead. All right, so this is the website. Go to summerofprotocols.com. And then if you click on SOP 24 CFA, this is what you'll get. So let me quickly walk through this. All right, so the program is three tracks. The first, the big track is protocol improvement grants. So this is teams of two. We'll be giving five grants of 90,000 each, roughly over the summer. We start in May and in August, but with some fuzziness at the boundaries, depending on the specifics of your uh, project. And the idea here, let me click here and go to that section, is that you're going to try and improve an existing protocol. So don't get utopian and think about like, you know, how an idealized science fiction world is going to be. Look at something real, whether it's, you know, hand washing or nuclear launches or, uh, I don't know, traffic, uh, how traffic is managed, how voting is done, something that already exists in some form that you can study and see improvements in. So you want to like think about it in terms of researching what already exists, prototyping some change or improvement to it. And this, by the way, does not need to be incremental. Just because it exists already does not mean that any change to it has to be 1%. You can take a look at what exists and argue that this is terrible. It should be thrown away. And here's a completely new way of doing it. So radical solutions are in scope, but just not like completely made up utopian ideas. Start from somewhere real. And then you want to field test whatever you're thinking in a small way. So for example, if you have an idea for a better voting system in elections, obviously you can't expect to reform like you know the election system of the United States or a large country like that overnight. But you can do things like, all right, this is a voting scheme. Maybe there's a little conference or some sort of like um, small community where that voting protocol can be tried. Can I try out my prototype with a real group of people and field test it and like tweak it a little bit till it becomes like evidence that there's an idea here. And then you turn it into some sort of deliverable that can actually go and like impact things like the US elections at the national level. So you might do think in terms of start with something that could be improved, think about how to improve it, prototype and tweak it in like small experimental sandbox contexts, then turn it into a little piece of ammunition, weaponize it so that it can then become um, useful for a reform and change campaign at the largest levels, right? Same thing with climate. Like if you think there's a better way to like manage energy through like, you know, how you manage your air conditioners and heaters, try it in a small um, neighborhood or community, see if it works, gather data and create a proposal saying, this is a much better way to manage energy. And then maybe it can go all the way to, I don't know, the UN, right? So think in those terms. So that's the protocol improvement uh, grants. And note that this program is not for like core research on um, the Ethereum uh, protocol. There are other programs uh, run by the EF for that. But we do encourage you to think about if you're whatever pro problem you're looking at, 
could blockchain technologies be usefully applied there? So that's in scope. And in reverse, maybe you're studying something like, I don't know, safety protocols in the coal industry like Timber did last year. And maybe you have ideas from that domain. And then you can ask, are there general mechanisms here that I can then borrow and apply to blockchain-based architectures? So this kind of like cross flow is in scope. And Tim will say a little bit more about how to think about that. OK, so mechanics of this to apply, there are two components. You have to post an RFC in the forum. I'll show you that in a minute. So this is kind of like a public comment phase. We do want to move this com uh, program into heavily public facing kind of ways. Uh, and then there's an individual application. Links to both are over here. There's the individual application form link and then the RFC's forum link. Uh, take a look at those. Um, and um, both can be kept in draft mode, so please be early about this. So post your RFC and put in your form early. You can edit both all the way till the deadline. So put in both your application and RFC forum link. It'll also help us kind of like, you know, see the applications coming in and what sort of uh, flow there is. So that's the first one, 90,000, two people over the summer. Second um, program is the pill challenge. So <clears throat> we, we are having a little bit fun here. So last year we had a lot of fun with making memes, jokes, uh, uh, cute little ways of like uh, conveying insights to each other, quotes we shared. And we realized that these things play a big role in getting people to have that light bulb moment, you know, that sense of, aha, I now get what protocols are, why it's useful and interesting to see the world through the lens of protocols. And we call this nerd sniping. We were making jokes about nerd sniping each other on protocols all the time. But nerd sniping is kind of like a mechanism that doesn't scale. In a small group of nerds who are all like curious in somewhat similar ways, you can constantly go around nerd sniping each other. But you know, there's a reason nerds are considered a minority. There's very few of us. So think of protocol pilling as a way to like level up um, nerd sniping to large audiences. Like you know, I've like walked you through several concepts. Can you turn some of them into really funny memes that can then really go viral and give a lot of people that same aha moment. Can you write a short story? Can you write a little gag panel? So we are going to be giving out 20 grants of $1,000 each. These are, we think of them as development grants. They're not prizes or rewards for finished work. They're to help you get started. And we encourage you to think small. The $1,000, think of it as like a small seed to test out like a concept that has memetic potential, but don't let yourself be limited to that. Like if it really works, like, you know, Maybe you write like a short story that really catches on and goes viral. You should be willing and uh, interested in turning it into a novel, a screenplay, maybe a movie. Why can't we have the first protocol movie, right? So think of things as what is this? This is actually a similar philosophy to the big um, part, which is look at the world around you with a protocol lens, see something that's absurd or funny. So the protocol improvement, people have to look at ways to improve the world through actually acting on it. You have to look at it through like, Protocol lens, what's funny about it when I look at it through a protocol lens or what's kind of like intriguing or weird about it? Like, you know, pick on something that you can you know, sort of like turn into a creative output. Try something to test out whether that thing has legs, like, you know, whether it's funny or weird, see if you can like communicate that to somebody else, like infect somebody else with that same way of looking at that particular thing, keep it very particular. And then, you know, turn it into a creative work and expand it. So here, my big tip to you is going to be, Keep it as specific as possible, like, you know, hand washing. Like, don't think about, like, abstractions of protocols and big definitions and some of the theoretical concepts we've been working on. Think in terms of, all right, what's funny about hand washing? Like, you know, I, I often see those memes that um, hand washing stations that uh, are optically triggered often can't recognize darker skin. And a lot of, like, uh, people are worried about bias in technologies because of that. But there's also kind of a funny aspect of that. And there's been SNL skits about that, about, like, Black people trying to wash their hands and bathroom dryers not working. And so there's like, you know, there's a chance opportunity for reform there as well as something funny, right? So think in those ways and come up with like uh, ways to like communicate um, your way of looking at the world. So that's the pill challenge. 20 of these and maybe we'll do more about this uh, uh, later and we'll build on it. This is very much planting seeds and seeing where it goes because we had a lot of fun with this stuff last year. And the last thing I want to uh, talk about in the program itself is there is um, a partner track. So we'll be doing something with the Center for Strategic Futures in uh, Singapore. We'll be doing something with this think tank called GDI in Zurich. And we'll be doing something with this Edge City pop-up city 
uh, which was Zuzalu last year. Uh, they'll be doing something in the Bay Area in um, uh, June and then later in Thailand uh, in October, I think. So we'll be having some sort of presence there. Want to put this on your radar because if you happen to be in these regions or your team overlaps with uh, uh, what we're trying to do with these partners, there'll be overlap opportunities. So it's not essential that you align with one of these, but if your application happens to align with one of these, we'll be able to actually do more to support you than if it didn't align. So think about uh, what's happening here. And in, we, we will actually have room to support a couple more partners. So if your organization is interested in participating in this program in some way, get in touch. There's a form here that you can look at. Um, the, uh, actually, that was not the last thing, there's one more thing. So finally, I wanna close um, this part of it with, we do have sets of problems and domains we are particularly interested in. You don't have to target these domains or problems, but if you do, again, It'll be very salient to things going on in the world, and there may be follow-on opportunities. There'll be ways to like do more, right? But again, keep in mind, really, we don't want you to uh, stick to these domains if you can think of really good projects in other domains. So this is just a suggestion. Domains, it's all the obvious ones. AI and robotics, governance and public policy, management and organization um, design. So you know, making protocols a way of management. Like um, there's been like 60 years of MBAs managing organizations a particular way, can they manage through protocols instead? Protocols for art and culture production. So some of this kind of experimentation has already been going on in the blockchain and AI worlds, but can we protocolize the art world in a deeper way? And of course, climate action is kind of the 800 pound gorilla in the room. So anything you can do with uh, protocols for climate action. Uh, there's a couple of good guest talks from last year about this, by the way, if you're thinking of that. Uh, so those are our domains. Problem areas, and Tim will have a little bit more to say about this because this is kind of where overlaps with the blockchains come in, but simplifying complex protocols because in some ways the world is too complex. How do you manage a life cycle of protocols? Because they tend to be much longer lived than you know things like uh, corporations or governments or even entire nations, right? Uh, cities like uh, ancient cities like Rome have been around for thousands of years through multiple empires and some of the viaducts are still working. So protocols have lifespans in the millennia. So life cycles are interesting to think about. Protocols and patterns of conflict are very interesting right now, not just because there's two wars on, but all the way down to like, you know, there's culture wars on, there's conflict at like small institutions or control of institutions. So anything about conflict is kind of interesting. And finally, protocols and rare or exceptional events. So in the blockchain world, we're very used to this. Obviously, there are always like, you know, some sort of big crisis going on, some big exploit or bug or some big scam going on. So it's a world of like, exceptional events that need management. But this is true of all protocols. Like right now, Boeing is going through a crisis of its um, 737 um, uh, MAX planes having lots and lots of accidents. And some of us are now getting afraid to fly on those particular models of uh, planes, right? Rare and exceptional events. If you were the CEO of Boeing, what protocols would you change to uh, sort of like both reassure the public and make planes actually more safe? If you were the chairman of the NTSB, so National Transportation Safety Board, how would you react to what's going on at Boeing right now? So these are the problem areas and domains. So think about them. Let's see, was there anything else here? Um, so additional resources, um, I'll show you a little bit over here, but yeah, keep all these dates in mind. So um, explore this page properly. Do want to like talk about a couple more um, resources here. Lots of the research from last year is already online. So I really strongly recommend that you go browse through them. You don't have to read all of it, but this will, we don't want you to get stuck on particular definitions of protocols, but we do want you to have like a rich set of examples and you know bunny trails to think um, for context. So there's like, I think about 20 pieces online. So browse them. And there's also talks. I already mentioned the two climate talks, but there's a whole bunch more. This one is coming up um, on the hour, uh, but yeah, browse, click on anything that interests you. Here's one about the chemical industry. Here's one about a guy who decided that blockchains were not for him. This is Yancy, the founder of Kickstarter doing it differently. Brian Johnson did a talk about health protocols. So lots of good stuff here. Watch a couple of talks, right? Uh, switching over to the other resource you should keep in mind. All right. This is the forum, forum.summerofprotocols.com. 
lots of good stuff here. This is the main section you're going to be interested in, the SOP 2024 RFC section. I see there's already a few proposals here, both for pigs and pills. Take a look at them, add your own as early as possible. And to just add a little bit of a carrot for those of you who add earlier, I just posted this. We are opening up office hours for feedback. So look at this thread. Um, so Tim and I will uh, offer our time. So if you want some time for like live one-on-one -on -one feedback on your application, uh, post a comment here and we'll reach out. We'll devote as much time as we can. We can't promise that we'll be able to do everybody, but we'll only offer this to people who already posted an RFC and started your app. If you wait till the last minute, office hours are not open to you. And yeah, the general category, you can also post questions. There's other discussions going on. For those of you specifically interested in blockchains, there's a blockchain category with, uh, well, mainly me at this point, writing a lot of notes of my own thinking about blockchains. Uh, Protocol Watch has a lot of good, you know, sort of like food for thought protocols in all uh, sorts of domains, including historical ones. Like here's an interesting article about how uh, the astrolabe, which is an astronomical instrument, uh, kind of evolved in medieval times. So lots of good stuff here. So keep the protocol stuff in mind. And one more thing I want to point out, and thanks to Timber for doing this. For those of you who are new to thinking in terms of uh, protocols, we've compiled a list of resources. So of course, there's the research we ourselves have published, but we are very strongly against the, you know, not invented here syndrome. So we really want to like have a very open philosophy here. And we want you to like go wherever there's inspiration. So all these are links from uh, other sources besides their own research. Look at them. So we've organized them by big uh, references and pill references to give you some inspiration. So take a look at this. Like I would say an afternoon uh, devoted to like browsing through these links as well as through the um, um, summer protocols uh, research from last year, that'll really strengthen sort of the context of your application and you'll kind of get a sense of what we're looking for. So let's go back to, that's the program tool. Let me share this. Okay, finally, some tips. Uh, I, I'll be sharing these slides later, by the way, and you can look through them at leisure. Uh, but yeah, don't worry too much about definitions, but not too little either. Start with the simplest possible behavior that can already uh, that already exists. Don't start in abstract idealized places. And I think it's very useful to reason backwards from what it would take to drive a real change. So ambitious, think ambitious at the end point, right? What would it take to change the voting system of the US? What would it take to make carbon credit trading a reality? Then work backwards to a problem that's at a size and scale that you can actually prototype and test within the scope of this program and your means. Like, you know, you need connections and stuff to do these things as well. So that's for pigs. So for pills, slightly different orientation, you know, read comics, um, think of like the smallest, simplest way. Like what, if you had 30 seconds in an elevator with somebody and you wanted to like convince them protocols are cool, what would you say in 30 seconds? Uh, I like this Fred Paul quote of the job of the science fiction writer is not to predict the automobile, but the traffic jam. So think about protocol technologies coming online today and ask what are the traffic jams of the future that will uh, emerge from the contradictions and paradoxes here. Think cypherpunk. Don't get caught in like boring frames of like, you know, utopian or dystopian uh, ways of looking at the world. Get more creative about that, you know, look for absurdity. Uh, and one thing I do want to point out is no nonfiction. We are not going to be, um, we did that last year. So this is specifically on like more creative sort of fiction themed things. All right. So I don't want to go too much over time. Let's see. All right. So over to Tim now. Uh, to talk a little bit about what we're looking for on, in blockchain apps specifically. Thanks, Vikit. Um That was great and a lot to digest. So yeah, glad we'll have the slides as a as a reference for after. Um, and yeah, I guess I wanted to take a, a perspective here on like looking at a specific domain and what are like some themes that come up and, and how they show up and, and trying to um, highlight like, you know, what it would look like to, to study this in the context of Ethereum, but uh, potentially also the, the similar themes recur in other places. I have a blog post on the Summer Protocol forums about this called Blockchain Protocol Problems Brain Dumps and it, a brain dump and it effectively goes over the three things on this slide. Um, one big question, you know, in Ethereum's case is when we have protocol uh, potential features, like things that protocols could do, should we have them as part of the protocol or outside of the protocol? And how should that change over time? 
And that is some examples for Ethereum, both for like some pretty small things, like how Ethereum handles timestamps has changed over time. Um, Ethereum, for example, doesn't have a concept of price in the protocol either, even though in the applications, this is like broadly used. Um, and Ethereum's entire like scaling strategy around rollups and error twos actually relies on fully externalized uh, protocol constructions to like scale the protocol itself. Um, so just this like trade-off between, okay, how should you think about adding something in the protocol versus removing it? I think is is like a really interesting area. I'm probably one of the easier ones to explore, um, but I wanted to highlight it. Um, at the end of the, the section in my post, there's also two great blog posts by Vitalik uh, that looked at this in more depth in the context of, of Ethereum. Um, and I think, yeah, this is like a first really interesting angle um, and, and, and the type of thing where there's probably some general principles um, beyond just Ethereum that are, that are valuable. Um, the second one is um, how do you deal with emerging complexity if you have to maintain backwards compatibility for a protocol? And I think this is an access where like protocols are very different than products, right? Like if you're just building your products, you you can have like a very uh, strong stance against like backwards compatibility. Just say, you know, like, for example, one of the, 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 the most obvious ones is like the fact that every single iPhone has a different size that's like relatively close to each other. And then you still need to have like a different case and all of that. Um, it's like a product decision where you're saying like, it's fine. This has a completely different form factor and the previous ones don't work. Um, on Ethereum, when we change things though, not only do we have to um, maintain backwards compatibility um, with with uh with old users but we have to do this in a way where we can never deprecate the old contracts on the network and this is like a really hard challenge where if you have like all these dependencies that you need to maintain then it means every additional change you're making to the protocol needs to accommodate all of these edge cases right you can't just say here's a clean new feature because it probably interacts with everything that was already there and therefore you need to like tweak it in a bunch of ways and potentially uh make it worse than it otherwise would be if you were starting from a clean slate and it's a really hard problem like how do you balance those two things because you can't just say like okay this version is completely unusable because it's like a protocol. It's it's not something that um, you have full control over. Um, so exploring that trade-off of like, if you're if you're maintaining strong backwards compatibility, um, in Ethereum's case, uh, one complexity as well is the composability. So everything's open. So it's not only one user using one product, but it's a many-to-many -many relationship. Um, this implies that you create all of this additional complexity to deal with it. Um, and, and, and yeah, like, is there a better framework that you can come up with to think about the, the trade-off between those two things and potentially try to run like one experiment in like reducing complexity or you know introducing something that's actually simple in a highly backwards compatibility requiring environment um and in this section i link this gets pretty technical on the ethereum side but i link a whole uh context around like an op code that we removed um, and and sort of the process that it took to go there. And um, the end solution has a bunch of these edge cases it has to accommodate. Um, and it feels, you know, it moves forward, but it does feel like a, a lot of complexity. Um, and then lastly, this is probably like the, the millennium prize for blockchains. Uh, so how to think about uh, adapting protocols long-term uh, versus, um, versus basically them ossifying your, or stopping to adapt. And the trade-off is effectively like, um, if you if you want, if you have a protocol, you want it to be reliable and to make like strong guarantees to people. Um, again, this is something that's even more pronounced in the case of a blockchain, where if I own some ether on Ethereum, I expect the ether to still be there, you know, in the future. Um, and so there, there is like a long-term commitment that you're making, but this is true of a bunch of other protocols, but, as you, um, but as, as, as time passes, you know, there's probably a bunch of changes you want to make to your protocol just because the world around it changes, right? Um, you know, in the case of Ethereum, there's a bunch of computer science advances. There's a bunch of cryptography advances we'd like to leverage. So it, it sort of puts us on a, on a path where like, you can never stop changing this thing. But if you can never stop changing the protocol itself, um, you, you always have this risk 
um, you always have this risk where um, the changes that you're making in the future, again, bring in a budget complexity or, or break backwards compatibility in some way. And so even having the door open to those changes kind of weaken the assur assurances that your protocol makes because somebody could come and change it in the future. And for example, you know, in, in Bitcoin's case, this is one of the most, uh, like one of the strongest claims of their protocols is there'll only ever be 21 million coins. Um, and the idea there is no one will, be able to change the protocol to, to modify that. And if you open the door to like smaller change or even other types of changes, um, you sort of weaken the, the, the assurances people can have around like this other invariant not being changed. So how do you deal with this yeah, trade-off between wanting to make long-term commitments for your protocol and, and having it be something that, that persists through time, but also adapting to the world around it as it evolves is, a, is another huge, huge question and probably like the hardest unresolved question in uh, blockchain protocols. All right. Thanks, Tim. So internal versus external, complexity management, and adaptability versus authentication. So if you're thinking blockchains, these are some interesting problems to think about. Uh, again, these are suggestions. If you come up with creative other uh, ideas, go for them. And last bit, I know we are going a little late, but we will leave time for a couple of questions at least uh, live. Let me see. All right. So Timber is um, alumnus of last year's program. And even though this year's program has several like, you know, key structural differences, we are trying to um, retain the philosophy and vibe. So I thought it would be interesting to have Timber share a little bit of his experience from last year. Yeah. Thanks, Venkat. Um, so last year was a really, really great experience. There were about 30 researchers, a couple more, and a wide variety of projects. Like there were people from video games and engineers and people working on like astrology and law, and all sorts of stuff. And so that led to some surprising opportunities to collaborate with people. Like I got to work with somebody that was a alumni of the, of IDEO to make a card deck for health and safety. And I was just some dude interested in health and safety. And I saw this program and got to meet tons and tons of smart people. Um, and get together and study and write and theorize. But by the end of it, I think a lot of us involved wanted to find applications for what we studied in these protocols and kind of this common theme everybody was trying to figure out, which is why this summer is so exciting because it's more application focused and people will be building on real world things and getting them out there and testing it. Um, I think one constant that's gonna carry over from last summer is kind of this ambition that everybody had to change the world and be this small group having a really outsized impact and maybe swinging and punching above our weights, but with a really potent um, tool. And the world has got lots of problems today and having a new lens to approach them is, is a great thing. I think something that can be expected again for this summer as well is there's a high expectation of, um, of output like I think Ben Cap put it last summer that we're expected to do like PhD level work. And as somebody with a bachelor's degree, I was kind of intimidated. So, it, but it all worked out. I think everybody's there is very supportive. So if you have any hesitations about if your project is a good fit or if it's a big enough swing, just say it and somebody will encourage you and get you to beef it up in the right way. Um, and yeah, it was a little bit hard to describe the project to people outside of it, but that was also such a comforting experience to have people invested in this thing. And we never achieved consensus on a hard definition, but everybody achieved consensus that there was something important there and valuable in real life. So yeah, all in all, 10 out of 10. I hope everybody applies for this summer. All right. Thank you, Timber. And with that, uh, we have about 10 minutes left for questions and we'll take as many as we can live, but we will respond to any questions you post on the forum as well. Um, so yeah, Josh, you want to uh, like curate the Q&A? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the chat right now that I will uh, read aloud. If you do have questions about anything that's been uh, presented here, please do throw it there in the YouTube chat. Uh, the first question is from John Neal. He asks, uh, can you uh, please speak further on how domains and problem areas are distinct or how they overlap? 
Yeah, so uh, we are thinking of this as a matrix of um, ways to factor out problems. So ossification, for example, is a problem that occurs across all sorts of protocols, whether it's blockchains or urban uh, planning domains or whatever. Um, and the domains are kind of like verticals. Think of it as like, you know, urban planning is a domain with particular grammars and vocabularies and expertise that are that go on the depth axis but anything you learn about you know how cities get ossified might generalize to lessons for how blockchains ossify or how nuclear command and control ossifies right so that's kind of what um, those two are about awesome uh we have a youtube user asking can you talk a little bit about the variety of project outputs that we're looking for tim you want to feel this Yes, I was looking for the button. Um, yeah, I think in this case, like it's broader than the first cohort, so harder to define a bit. But think of it as like experimental data. We want people to try and run an experiment. Like in the Ethereum case, you know, is there something? Is there some smaller version, a toy version of this that we could actually make a simplifying change to? Um, and trying to interact with that process, where like you're actually trying to get data on answering the question um and, and and figuring out like if it works and i this is all very abstract but like the i guess the takeaway from last summer was that protocols feel like you you sort of get them when you start working on them and tweaking them and interacting with them um and you know to take some, say like timber's example it's like you know something around safety protocols is there some context in which you could change a safety protocol or change the process by which a safety protocol is devised and like run that experiment. Um, so I think this is the main thing we're looking for is cases where there are real world um, opportunities to actually, you know, try out some of these ideas um, rather than just, you know, building out theory. Um, another one I'll point out, for example, so yesterday we released uh, Chanel's uh, artifacts from the from her work. She has all of these like amazing architectural patterns and and like thoughts and and, and designs. Um, and it's like, could you run you know one of them somewhere and and sort of quantify like the change that this has made? Um, so this is really the type of things we're looking for, like something that goes from like theory to practice. Um, when we were first brainstorming this, someone joked that uh, SOP1 was you know, mostly word cells and we're looking for shape rotators in SOP2. Um, and while that's not like a perfect definition, I think this is what you, sh you should expect. It's like, you should be working on something, on an existing protocol, tweaking it, and whether this is something that takes the form of code you know, like Ethereum, takes the form of like more, um, more like, uh, I don't know, uh, formalized social protocols like the safety example or takes the, the form of like stuff in the real world like the built environment and architectural patterns um those are the type of things we're looking for people to, to work on directly um so. uh, i'll add a couple more um, examples that's so one good example of uh, uh, what i would um, think of as a protocol innovation experiment is um, a UBI. So it was an abstract economics idea of like giving people universal basic income. Obviously it would be a huge change to economic management at country level, but several foundations tried extremely small scale UBI um, experiments and came up with data on, yes, this works in these contexts and so forth, right? And again, it was like, look at existing areas where people already have like you know policy infrastructure make a small tweak in an experimental way generate evidence and the output of it even though it may might not be well defined in terms of whether it's going to be code or a written document or whatever it is well defined in another sense in that whatever your experiment or field test or whatever you do the output should become ammunition for trying the same thing at uh, higher level scale, whatever the particular form is, it should allow you to scale it up if it works. Or if it doesn't work, it should like you know suggest directions for all right, maybe this way of doing the protocol doesn't work, but therefore you should look at this other way. So think of think like an experimenter, really. And one thing, yeah, one thing also I'll highlight on that is um, in terms of the partnerships, like we've tried to find some orgs um, that can help like set up these contexts and like these playgrounds. So one I'll call out is Ed Shitty. They basically run pop-up like cities. Um, you know, they'll do one in California this uh, June, and then one in in Asia later this year. 
And those are like the perfect playgrounds to like try and, and run what some of these experiments. It obviously doesn't have to be confined to, to places like that, but um, I think this is something we also want to figure out, like, you know, what are some some sort of sandboxes that we can we can come up with to help people um, yeah, run those things. Uh, and I would apply the same philosophy at a smaller scale to the pill grants as well. You want to take an experimental mindset there too. Like if you think of like five clever memes that might protocol pill somebody and you want to turn one of them into a short story, tweet them out and see which one makes people laugh. And then the one that works best, turn it into a short story. So think like an experimenter. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim and Venkat. Um, any final questions before we wrap it up here, please throw it in the chat. We'll give about 30 more seconds to, to that. Otherwise, uh, if you do have questions uh, in the future that you would like to have answered, please go ahead and post them in the forum at forum.summerprotocols.com. Um, yeah, I'm going otherwise... to, I think there's uh, one question in this uh, chat here. In regards to technology, we are not limited to blockchain when it comes to protocol improvement grants. Correct. So if you're interested in blockchains, apply with a blockchain team. But if you want to work on anything that doesn't involve blockchains at all, so long as it's protocols, that works. Um, all right. So Gary Wolf uh, asks, for protocol improvement ideas, maybe useful to code a toy version for public inspection. Any preferences about what blockchains to use are totally open? Tim, you have a quick thought on that? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, look, I think a lot of us uh, have background and understanding with Ethereum, um, so you'll probably get more support. But it's definitely not like a hard constraint. Um, I think that the thing, the thing I'd look for in like a blockchain or any domain is just like protocol richness, if that makes sense. So um, you know. I think another example like Bitcoin is like a very opinionated blockchain protocol. It makes a lot of different decisions from Ethereum. Um, and I can imagine a lot of topics that would be like better suited to study in that context. Um, so that would be like my main just like suggestion is, um, you know, find something where like there's enough depth uh, that it's actually a protocol. And I think if you start scrolling down the list of blockchains, like you very quickly get the, a, a step function decrease in quality. Um, and there's probably just like less interesting stuff to look at there. Um, but yeah, um, there's no uh, there's no hard requirement that it's on Ethereum or anything like that. All right. I think we're almost at time, just a minute left. Um, Josh, you want to give people um, uh, how to join the um, uh, guest talk in a minute? So how can they yeah, join? Uh, I will throw a link here in the chat. Uh, you can also find it at, on our channel, the Protocol Town Hall channel. Uh, we'll be uh, coming up in one minute. All right. Thanks, everybody. And post your other questions in the forum. We will get to them. Thanks, everyone.